Hello guys and girls, um, it's me again, here to bring you another book review. Um, I'm going to try to make this one a little bit shorter, because uh, I'm a little bit... Um, it's been probably about a year and a half since I read this, so I'm a little rusty on it, but I hope I can retain as much um, uh, detail as I can. It's a book called Oblomov by um, Ivan Goncharov, or Ivan Goncharov, the Russian pronunciation. And it came out in, I believe, 1862, and it is a very funny satire. If there's one way of looking at it, but there's also a very, um, a very kind of, well, maybe not like very dark, as like maybe as dark as like Dostoevsky or you know some of Tolstoy's work. Um, but um, it is a little bit of a dark comedy in that sense, probably in the spirit of Nikolai Gogol or. Um, but yeah, it is a, to put it short, it is about a man roughly in his 30s in a Russian, um, high Russian society, aristocratic, and he um, kind of lazes about a lot, but he's more than just a lazy character, like, because he's not, he is uh, expiated from making decisions, or he, ex he believes his life philosophy is, since he owns serfs and he he basically leases since his youth um he goes into great detail later on in the novel um he uh has this philosophy on life where he basically doesn't believe in having to make choices or any being impun impugned upon or having the onus to make any life drastic life decisions or he believes that it's a bit like that um I don't know if it's an Aristotelian analogy of like the the donkey where the donkey is put in one isn't put in the middle equally placed from a I think it's like a, a stack of hay and then a pail of water and uh, hypothetically in this thought experiment the donkey will not be bothered to actually go either direction considering that he's equally starving and equally um, thirsty he'll just like starve to death is that I think that's what happens is his fate. So that is basically, in a nutshell, kind of Olimov's philosophy. He is, cannot be bothered at all. Um, Goncharov, I think, paints him in a, in a good light, like all the great Russian novelists. They, they don't just kind of say, like, this person is, you know, it's not a black and white binary worldview. It is very, you know, you get a very big glimpse into Olimov's mind. Um, you're given a good reason to kind of, you don't just sit there and judge him, uh, you kind of feel for him a little bit, at least I did. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the, the, um, the kind of overarching, um, inclination, like the, it's kind of like a, was it, I don't know if it's nihilism that he had, um, but he basically, he, all his work is, um, given to some, one of his best friends, like his benefactors, uh, benefactors who's like a lot older than him, and he reminds, remembers him from since childhood, so he's kind of, uh, he's kind of inured into this lifestyle of, uh, kind of lazing about, just, uh, dreaming, and he goes deep into his, like, childhood, and, and his mother, and how, and, in fact, in the middle of, dream, in the middle of the book, um, some point, there's, like, a very long dream sequence where Oblomov talks about his, you know, his family, and he just reminisces, and he says, you know, like, gives the image of, like, just paradise. Like, it's just, there's no responsibility. There's no, um, no being bothered with anything at all. Um, pretty much just, like, total, complete serenity. Um, and I think that's down to his character. Like, that's the philosophy of al, al it, His worldview is one of, um dream like he believes like i think there's a, a line from the book where he says something like we uh like we basically started this life not in a sleep you know we we in in a sleep rather and uh we're gonna end this life in a sleep so why not just get it over with or something to that effect it's kind of makes you think a little bit like is it it's like a very solipsistic kind of existence like you're denying almost anti-natalist in a sense, where it's like, you you just know that instantly life is suffering, all decisions, no matter what you do, 
is it Kierkegaardian angst of just uh, just like a preponderance of different other decisions could tie to that tiny little decision that you make so Oblomov seeing this and he's just like oh screw I'm out <laughs> so that's more like his worldview it's not it's not like a kind of it is childlike yes but it's not childish I guess I don't know if there's that distinction fits here but he definitely he is very immature obviously um like obviously every bone on your body's calling for, you know for waiting for him to get make take some action like you're just like he gets up like a major turning point in the novel is he actually gets up from his sofa or no i'm sorry from his bed to the sofa in the room and that's like treated as it's like this rising action <laughs> like so much has happened and uh yeah it's like very it's very comedic in that way it's very uh it's satire that's why uh i think that's a pretty reasonable term to use because satire not without heart i think um and yeah like i said in that sense that that, that kind of that type of um perspective kind of reminds me of the goals and you know like dead souls or the overcoat like there's like a sincere you know look into these kind of as in the overcoat with Chichikov, I believe. Um, even though he's kind of like a, and I'll try to uh, review that time, review that sometime as well. But there's kind of like a anti-hero. You know, he's very um, kind of like a like a con artist. You know, and he's like selling these dead souls to like kind of impressionable older people, um, landowners in Ru in Russia, and like let's do with like a city census and all that but yeah that's a premise and yeah but you're not you're not like pitted against him like you definitely like yeah of course you object to it but you but you can see you know you can emphasize with him for sure and the same thing goes with Lava Mob. um there's definitely a point in the novel going back to kind of the over overall plot uh when he does he is challenged to get out of bed by none other than a woman i believe uh is it olga i think is the name of her character and she basically kind of um prompts him to at least consider and like he's to change and she you know she's the one who like you know they actually like each other and he's like surprised that he likes her and they talk and they when he's over at their house and i think she's like a a friend of his family to begin with and um, yeah, he's, uh, Olimov finally is, uh, she basically challenges him and she's like, hey, like, listen, I do like you, but you need to, like, get your life in order. You need to, like, get out of bed. You need to take care of your serfs. Like, stop, stop, you know, shipping off all this, you know, uh, all your responsibility is on to your good friend and your benefactor. You know, this, he's been doing this all his life and he has no, and that's all he knows. And, like, that's, it's just, like, it's better to keep things as they are and you're, and you're, you know, she doesn't say this verbatim, obviously, but that's pretty much the sentiment. Is like, she's challenging him, and he doesn't like this. He actually takes offense to this. Like, he says something actually pretty, almost poetic, something to the effect of, um, I love you, I, I love you the way you are in your inherent state, so why can't you just return the favor? Like, this is the way I am. I, I need my, I need to, like, this is the way... I operate. This is my MO. <laughs> like, this is just, I sit in bed all day and, um, there's no prospects and, and I try to recreate that perfect dream. Because if you think about it, um, I guess ideologically or perceptively, there is no, when you're in dream sleep, when you're in a total unconscious state and, uh, and imagery, you know, past, you know, uh, phantasmagoria and whatnot overtakes um it's kind of like there's no um it's like the movie waking life said it's like the moment between you could be a, asleep for you know less than seven minutes or something but when that rem cycle gets in but you could experience so much within this dream condensed into time so it's just the idea i guess of Avamov um just letting himself be overtaken by dream and uh, yeah, it's like, it's, once you understand his viewpoint, the way he, you know, actually explains it quite clearly, um, you kind of get that. You kind of get where he's coming from. So, as far as, 
So as far as um, <clears throat> context goes, um, Goncharov was a uh, very, uh, you know, respected author in his own right, even though you might not hear his name as much as Dostoevsky or Tolstoy or, um, or Turgenev, but they all were contemporaries, roughly. Uh, they all kind of, they knew of one another, and they spoke of one another. And uh, I believe Dostoevsky didn't take a liking to him, and I think that um, he felt like his writing, like he called him kind of like something like half-witted. Um, not sure exactly, you know, what to expound on that, but um, I will say, like his prose, it's not unlike kind of what you fi find in any other Russian novel, and especially since I'm kind of bad at recalling his writing style. Um, I do remember the dream sections did feel a little bit lengthy. They did feel like, whoa, this is like 80 pages and we're still in that. Kind of the sense when Proust does a similar thing when he when he just talks about, <clears throat> you know, in Swan's Way, you know, in the first volume of In Search of Lost Time, um, which is very beautiful in its own right. And I'm actually, um, might as well keep you updated. I, I am on the second um, in the flower of the in the shadow of the young girl's flower in the shadow shadow of the young uh, girl in flower I think um, kind of a tough title to be <laughs> to memorize but yeah it's it's hard to get into you know to get past that you know like that stream of conscious we're gonna take a whole chunk of time because those are very necessary points like he's making sure the reader's acquainted with kind of how he perceives and how the nature of time and that's the whole entire thing about the book is Proust is at least and that's I think the reason I bring that up is because I think a similar thing goes for Goncharov I think he's trying to uh, really uh, portray candidly and that's like classic Russian realism right there and that's you know what all these Russian authors at the time had in common was this great you know like Turgenev did it well too and Fathers and Sons like and I'd like to do that as well uh -huh. and yeah it's just like it's a no holds bar type of just like this is what's going on these are certain people this is stu stuff that could exist and it very well did because at the time um, there were it was rumored that um, well not rumored but it was basically uh, said that uh, Gontra uh, say yeah, um, that he was like making fun of Russians for being lazy, and all the characters, most of the characters, in in the uh, revealed in the novel were actually uh, foreigners, like West, like Europeans, and you know the French and the Germans, and all they, all of them were uh, depicted as being very efficacious and industrious, whereas Abamov and the Russian classes were kind of like you know, hapless and indolent and languid. And so they took offense to that because Russians, I think they prize themselves, they pride themselves in their hard work, like they're as well. Um, but that kind of brings up the elephant in the room, which is the whole class division thing, which is, which was a real thing in Russia. Like it was, and despite be me being kind of, you know, I've listened to some documentaries, I've, you know, I've, I've, uh, but I haven't read too many like books, straight books on the subject of the history of like Russia, and, you know, and how, you know, up until like the 1917 revolution and all that. But I do know that right about the mid 1800s or 19th century, serfdom was abolished. So all of these serfs came kind of percolating into society, integrating, and all of a sudden they, um, they found themselves like with you know pretty good jobs and like kind of like on the same class on the same tantamount you know shoulder and shoulder with all these other russians and they felt like this was uh you know like the it was so there was no room for um growth or or you know rugged individualism or ayn rand type you know um type uh hard knock life type philosophy there but there was just like they had to instantly they had no other way and this is this beautifully or i'm sorry very 
humorously portrayed in uh, Nikolay Gogol's The Nose, which is a very funny story, very satirical, but this is, his was more magic realism, which is, um, I guess there are some parts like in the dream sequence in Abamov that felt very magically realistic, but overall, Gogol really took that magic realism, especially in The Nose, to such like this great, which is like pretty easy short story to read, uh, highly recommend, um, and he takes it to such fantastical kind of wacky elements, like, you know, like a Russian barber waking up and finding out in his uh, morning soup or his bread, I think that his wife makes him, he finds a nose, and then he finds out it's actually in the nose of one of his customers, so he's like <laughs> freaking out, um, and then it's kind of telling these two stories simultaneously, like the, the guy who loses it is actually a high-ranking official, I think, like, and uh, it should be stated at this point, you know, that um, Russian society prides itself. I've seen this time and time again all throughout, you know, Anna Karenina or any Tolstoy novel and all that, you know, up until maybe even Chekhov or, um, uh, you know, is this this um, uh, <clears throat> high, like, military militaristic families, like high people that prize themselves in kind of like officer ranking, like basically the, they were the social, you know, high, like they were the higher, highest echelon conceivable, were like the generals. So that is why you find a lot of these type of people like, oh, I'm a high ranking official. And, and then maybe the, the, the lower, more browbeaten people will be more like civil servants. And you'll see that a lot. Like you'll see in, you know, in Dostoevsky's The Double, like, which is actually not surprisingly based off of, you know, it t took inspiration from Gogol uh, by his own omission. And basically the only one that Nabokov actually liked by Dostoevsky, he had a fam famously didn't like the, or claimed that he didn't like Dostoevsky's writing or he found it mediocre in some sources claim. Um, but, but yeah, there is a um, huge gap in society as what in the Russian society. And um, it's kind of hard not to talk about, you know, the themes of Abamov without talking about the, you know, the plethora of different divisions and, you know, and um, there's a huge, like, anarchy type. That's what Fathers and Sons talked about, too, is that whole nihilism uh, revolution of, of youths that were, um, that were giving up on the old traditional values of these of the, like the liberal generation, I think is what Turgenev described them all as. And despite their disagreements, I, despite the fact that I think Turgenev and Dostoevsky were said to have been uh, somewhat of rivals, like they had a rivalry between them, because uh, because Dostoevsky said that, or he thought that Turgenev was too liberal, too open-minded, too accepting of Western values, whereas Dostoevsky was actually um, skeptical of all these. Um, and yeah, there's a, I think, I, the, despite all these differences, and despite that, you know, like, uh, Turgenev is also seen as, like, maybe, uh, maybe, like, the kind of red-headed stepchild in some sense, um, and I definitely have to read more of him to kind of get what, it, you know, his, his, uh, to get more of a sense of what his MO is, but yeah, I do, uh, I do get the sense that they're all kind of getting on a similar thing. Like they're painting, they're giving a portrait of holding up a mirror to like Russian society at the time. And it's very interesting. And I think that even though that's the case and it's and it's talking about a very particular point in time, I think it's very imperative too, because it's like, it holds up and it's very much prevalent. And a lot of what they were saying is like actually very um, pre prescient, you know, and like, uh, um, foreboding in a sense because it's like I, I can't count the amount of people like I've seen like certain album offs in real life or you know and you see kind of um yeah you see kind of like a lot of similarities rising up in pop culture and movies and stuff like um like the idea of kind of heck even like uh not Mr. Deeds but even in Billy Madison I guess you get a sense like there's you know somebody inheriting somebody who's unworthy and kind of childish, like, I guess, like, what, Dudley Moore's Arthur or something like that, like, something, the idea of, like, some childish body, you know, loud, obnoxious guy getting this money, but Abamov was different, like, he wasn't, 
you know, he wasn't this egghead. He wasn't a, um, he was just like a, like a very, uh, like placid dreamer, I think. Like he was just like a literal dreamer too. <laughs> like he, and there's a fun, another funny part in the novel where he claims that the reason Dieter, that he cannot get up, is that he has a rare disorder that he describes as oblomavitis. <laughs> he gives himself his own mental disorder. He just says, it's oblomavitis. That's why I can't get up. And it's just like the most ridiculous <laughs> thing you can think of. You're just like, oh gosh. Um, but I just thought that was pretty funny. Um, and yeah, like I said, it's it's very much prevalent today. Like, it's not, I don't think it falls out. That's why people still read them. That's why people, you know, it's like anytime I I read, like, you know, it's not just Russian literature. It could be Flaubert. It could be German literature. It could be anything. It's like, it's from the, t from the time and um, from, you know, from the 1800s all the way back to, like, before, you know, with Plato and whatnot and the first writings and when I think, you know, Plato said that the written word, like he was scared of it because it might take away people's the ability to think. And yeah, like all the way back then, I think there's this, you feel the connection to certain of these people. Like they're still very much a human message at the heart and they're speaking to a universal thing, but there is like kind of a macro or microcosm it of what's happening at the time. Um, but as I say, it's like history repeats itself in many ways, and a lot of what you see is like kind of an eternal return, I guess, of events. And, um, you you see similar divisions and you know disputes and wars and uh, border disputes and heck, even with the war in R Ukraine now. And I don't like to get super political, or um, but yeah, there's definitely um, to finish up what I was saying. Uh, there's a a kind of um, admirable th side to the coin of Abamov's kind of detachment and from the world is that he perhaps he kind of just sees the world as kind of inherently messed up and full of suffering and rife with stupidity and people's blunders that he just doesn't want to engage with it and I guess everybody to an extent can kind of at least agree you know to some extent with that I don't know about you know to the point where you're staying in bed all day but you know um yeah definitely recommend album of by ivan ivan goncharov um yeah check it out and i'll be it let me know what you guys think um leave a like leave a comment um if you feel compelled um uh, patreon uh i'm not hinging on that i'm not you know <laughs> i'm not being fed breadcrumbs or anything to the point where i need to be but It'd be nice, you know, if you guys feel like it, check it out. So, yeah. Thank you for watching.